Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, S.A. Uh, I'm a little dis- disappointed, though, because uh, I didn't get introduced real generously. Uh, I don't guess it makes a whole lot of difference. I, I, was, I was reading you a while back about a, a man that was fixing to be a speaker, and uh, the master of ceremonies introduced him very generously and uh, wound up by saying he was the man that made a million dollars in oil in California. So the speaker got up and he thought that, that maybe he should correct a little bit of this, and he thanked him for the introduction, and but he said he was just a little bit off, said, uh, uh, in the first place, it wasn't California, it was Pennsylvania, and in the next place, it wasn't oil, it was coal, and in the next place, it wasn't him, it was his brother, and in the next place, it wasn't a million dollars, it was a half a million. And to wind it up, he said he didn't make a half a million, he lost a half a million. <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't guess introductions amounts to a whole lot. Uh, just as names, uh, my name on this program is down here as Harold. Uh, frankly, I was just a little bit perturbed when I received the program, because uh, my name is not Harold. <laughs> and... Uh, 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 Emory was kind enough to write me a little note of apology and tell me that it was uh, an error on the point of the printers or someone had turned the name in wrong, and that kind of soothed my feelings a little bit. And then uh, I, I thought, well, I'm not before you this afternoon as Harold or Henry. My name is beside the point. It could be Joe or George or John or anything else. A name actually is the only thing that a name does is tell maybe who we are. And it doesn't particularly concern me uh, if you don't remember who I am ten minutes after I sit down. But it does concern me if you forget what I am. That is my entire interest in being here, not because I'm Henry, but because I am a recovering alcoholic, as many, many of you are, perhaps most of you. Uh, And because of the fact that I have learned that I can live and uh, regulate my life without having to resort to alcohol or narcotics. Uh, My name is, of course, Henry, and I'm definitely an alcoholic. And certainly by God's grace and people like you, I haven't drank any alcohol in almost 11 years. The first day of November would be 11 years if the Lord is good to me and the creek don't rise and I don't have a slip. Uh, I don't have any reason to fear uh, that I will. Although for almost 11 years, uh, I have went without a drink one day at a time, just like you have. And if I continue to do that, uh, why then it will be 11 years very shortly. Uh, I don't suppose that uh, there is any characteristics of alcoholics. I've heard that there weren't, but I don't know. Uh, I think if there were any indications or characteristics in early life that a person was going to be an alcoholic, I believe that I had them. Because from right here in this city of Dallas, about five months before I was 11 years old, 
it became necessary to put me somewhere where someone could control me. And I wound up in the state reformatory in Gatesville, Texas. Uh, I had every characteristic, as I look back now, uh, that I had even in the latter years, uh, of uh, rebellion, self-centeredness, self-pity, resentment, all of the things that uh, I carried on with me through life up until the time I was 45 years of age. Uh, I had, according to me, a perfect valid reason to be resentful and to be rebellious and to be uh, a nonconformist. Uh, I had a stepfather, and uh, whether or not my stepfather was mean or no good to me was beside the point because I had already established the fact in my mind that stepfathers weren't any good. So consequently, I wouldn't go to school. Uh, I wouldn't stay home. Uh, I, ha I had never up to that time committed, say, a crime, actually. Uh, but I run the streets of this town of Dallas, and, and uh, they put me in a couple of different homes, and uh, they called them, I think, detention homes. I, I believe they was trying to keep them sending me to Gatesville as young as I was. I wasn't 11 years old. And I'll never forget the, the last time they did, and two good women that uh, were working with wayward boys uh, had dressed me all up to bring me into town to find out whether or not I was going to get to, uh, going to be uh, permanently stationed or permanently left in this home or what. And I heard one of them make the remark that poor little fella, that he's all dressed up and nowhere to go. And I thought, old gal, that's what you think. And I went. I went out over the back fence, and I didn't stop until uh, they caught me again. And that time they sent me to Gatesville, and they said, you will stay put there. And I did. I didn't run off from there because the third day I was there, one of the guards put his foot on the boy's neck and beat him to death. And I didn't want none of that, so I, I, I watched myself. But I went on into the age of 15 before I uh, ever tasted alcohol. And uh, then I found a new world. Uh, I got drunk on my 50th birthday, and I found just exactly what I wanted. I got sick, real sick, and I vomited. And it was for a while I couldn't stand the smell of home brew. But it, I couldn't get this out of my mind of the satisfaction I got out of there for a while until I got where I didn't know anything. So I went back looking for that again, and I looked for it from the time I was 15 until I was 45. And during that time, I had married, uh, became the father of six children, and not a very good father, I'm bound to say. We never, <clears throat> when we were raising our family, had anything very much. I often get real amused at people that talk about uh, what they had uh, before they managed to lose it all in drinking. Uh, they were has-been and all of that, and, and I never was a has. Uh, I'm satisfied that alcohol was responsible for that because uh, my drinking, of course, become progressively worse. Now, when I became a, a chronic alcoholic, I don't know. Uh, it might have slipped up on me. I could have been an a alcoholic from the beginning, uh, or I could have been like the preacher that I heard about that got all run down and the doctor told him if he would take a good toddy every morning, uh, it would build up his blood and he would have a lot of vim and vigor and vitality. And he said, no, I can't do that. said, I'm a preacher. And they would probably kick me out of the church. And I know my wife would quit me if she smelt my whiskey on my breast. She's very much against it. So the doctor figured out a way to get by that. He put in some whiskey in a 
medicine bottle and told him to set it up in his shaving cabinet. And every morning when he shaved, take him a good stiff jolt of it and then shave and put a whole lot of shaving lotion on his face and said that will smell so loud it'll kill the smell of that alcohol. Nobody won't know it. So he said, well, we'll try that. And a few days later, a few weeks later, the doctor saw the preacher's wife down on the street and asked about his health. And she said, he's fine. He's just a boy. said, he's just going like the house of fire all the time. He said, well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I don't guess then he'll be needing my services anymore. And she said, no, but I think I'm going to have to take him to a psychiatrist. And he wanted to know why. And she said he got to where he shaved five, six times a day. <laughs> so... It might, I might have possibly, uh, I might have been like that preacher, I don't know. But nevertheless, I, I drank during this uh, 30 year period from uh, not so awful bad to too awful bad, and then worse than that, I suppose, if it's possible. And when I came into contact with that A in at the age of 45, I had been put in jail in this little country town so many times up there for drunk that the justice of the peace had got ashamed of himself for finding me. Couldn't pay the fine anyhow. And uh, so this particular time, they he said, I don't want to try him. You try him talking to, uh, talking to the justice of peace. The city judge is the one that's been trying him. So he put me off on justice of the peace. He said, well, I'll fix him. He said, I'll stick a fine on him. I know he can't pay it, and, and they'll put him in jail, and uh, uh, he'll have to stay in there and lay that fine out, and he figured it out where I'd have about 43 days of jail time. And he stuck it, stuck me with it, and of course I couldn't pay it. And I hadn't been in jail but a day or two till I heard the doors clang or open up in the front, and the sheriff come back and said there was a couple of men that wanted to see me. And there was. It was you. It was A.A. That my oldest son had spoken to a man that he knew that was in Alcoholics Anonymous and asked him would he come and talk with me. And thank God he said yes. Uh, now, well, I was in another town. I was in the county seat. This was in another town. And he and another man dropped everything and came to that jail to see me. And told me about Alcoholics Anonymous and asked me if I would like to live without alcohol. And I believe that by that time, sincerely and honestly, uh, I wanted that more than anything. So I told him yes. And they talked to the sheriff, and the sheriff said, well, I'll, I'm going to let him go. And uh, if he'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I won't, he won't have to say he's serving 40-something days in jail. So then I thought, well, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, I, I liked what these fellas was talking about, uh, but somewhere there was something else that I liked, I guess, I suppose, better. And I had a lot more drinking to do after that. I had some more jails to get into. I got the only DWI I ever got in my life three years after I went to go into AA. And I went five years through the very pits of hell because when they tell you that if AA don't help you, it'll mess up your drinking, they're sure right. The feeling of guilt. The feeling of remorse, the feeling of despondency, the feeling of fear had multiplied hundreds of times before that five years was up. I don't know what was the matter with me. I know that I just couldn't stay sober. I know that I often say in that little group up there where we had one meeting a week that I went to Alcoholics Anonymous more than some of the people did that were staying sober, and I couldn't stay sober. I couldn't accept something. I couldn't take on this thing. Uh, and I think perhaps now that I look back on it that I still didn't want to accept any kind of a responsibility. 
I wanted to have something to depend on, some kind of a crutch, some kind of an outlet, uh, where I couldn't say that I've got to do this. And I remember resenting those people in in that AA program because of the fact that they were staying sober and I wasn't. And I kept groping and I kept seeking. And I wore out all of them AA members trying to sponsor me. There wasn't very many of them. And two or three of them, I think I got them drunk. The same two men that came over to call on me in this jailhouse. Neither one of them didn't stay sober long after that. Uh, I, I don't know what happened to them. Uh, and one of them had never been able to stay sober since. But then something happened five years after that. The first day of November of 1955, after about a week or ten days of drunk, not being able to eat, uh, I was working purely for to make enough money to maybe buy something else to drink. Now, all of this time, uh, when my children were growing up, uh, and they couldn't have the things that children love to have, of course. Uh, I never was a, a big money maker. I was always a wage worker. And uh, uh, that made it much worse because I drank, because uh, I would think of those children and I would think of what they should have, what they needed, uh, and I'd go get drunk. <laughs> Our first four children quit school when they were just up in high school good when they begin to uh, be conscious of their clothes and of their shoes and of their activities where they were unable to uh, attend the little school parties the little school dances it means so much to a teenager they had to quit school because of a shame and that during that time it never once entered my head that I was responsible for this because of my drink. Uh, I I could feel sorry for myself because the world had dealt me a foul blow. Uh, I hadn't been uh, able to do these things not because of my actions or my behavior or the way I was living, but because the world just wouldn't let me get up and get ahead like it did some other people. And it was very easy for me to resent people and very easy for me to feel sorry for myself. And that was one of the things, even after managing to do without alcohol, that it was long before I could forgive myself for. Because I know what I deprived those children of. There were two girls and two boys in these four older children. And... The girls were deprived, really, of a girlhood because they both married when they were 15 years of age. One of them liked a few days being 15 because they didn't have any home. Uh, it wasn't, <coughs> excuse me, it wasn't turmoil. It wasn't beating and fighting all the time like I've heard many people say. It just simply wasn't a home. We were lucky. They married two good boys. They've all got families now, and they're happily married. They've never had any trouble, really. And the boys, of course, quit and went to get the jobs elsewhere, left home uh, just a minute they could do so. And uh, I don't think those children hated me. I think they just couldn't respect me because I was so inadequate so irresponsible, so undependable. And they couldn't entertain their little friends from school at our house. Uh, In the first place, whatever place I happened to be living, they would be ashamed to ask children to come back. I mean that. You know, a lot of you people probably can't realize this, but after 25 years of married life, when I stopped drinking, we didn't even have a cook stove or a heater that we could call ours. We had an old leaky coal oil cook stove that we had borrowed from a farmer that had bought it for some hoe hands. And the the hoeing season was over, and it was sitting out there in his barn, and I'd borrowed it from him because I couldn't buy a stove. 
I had a little old sheet iron heater that I'd got at the hardware store uh, that I could provide a little bit of far end by going around where they were building houses uh, with a tow sack or something and carrying some blocks home. That's the kind of home we had when I took my last drink. And I don't know what happened, as I said in the beginning, uh, on the first day of November of 1955, when uh, we were working and we liked, uh, we'd had to work some overtime to finish out a field. I was operating a combine and we were going to have to work some overtime to finish out this field. And the man said, if you'll do that, I'll buy you a steak supper as well as pay you for the overtime. And I said, man, I couldn't eat steak supper unless I had a drink. I might then. He said, I'll give you a drink, too. So we finished the field and went to the cafe. I went by the bootleggers and got a pint of whiskey. Went to the cafe and sit down and ordered a steak, and he picked up his glass of water and drank the water out of it and filled the glass up with whiskey and pushed it across to me, and I drank the whiskey out of it, just like he did the water, a big water glass full of whiskey. And he said, my God, Henry, I didn't aim for you to drink all of that. And I said, well, if you didn't, you shouldn't have gave it to me first. He aimed for all three of us to drink out of that glass. <laughs> and I told him that, seeing that that was the last drink of whiskey that I ever was ever going to take, I thought that I ought to take a good one. And with God's grace, I can tell you today that that was the last drink that I've taken. I don't know why I said that that night any more than I know why that I went to that little AA group the next night was a beaten night. And that I told them, by God, I thought this time I was going to make it. And I'd been going there periodically for five years. And I don't know why I said that that night. But by the grace of God, I've made it since. I don't know why that when I, on Saturday, that I, I got down in town and I got playing dominoes with some of the AA members. And uh, I suddenly discovered it was 11 o'clock at night and on Saturday night and I had $40, $50 in my pocket and my wife was home by herself. And I knew how she'd be feeling. And so one of the boys carried me home and I hastened to assure her, reassure her that uh, I hadn't had a drink that day, that I still had what money I had. And to my surprise, she made a remark that I didn't even think about you drinking tonight. I think maybe that there's where my faith began to build. I lay there a while, and I thought about that. And I said, why did she say that? Why did she tell me that she didn't think that I'd come home drinking tonight? We had been married 25 years. We had lived almost all over the state of Texas uh, and also for part of one year in California. And there had never been any Saturday nights like that. If I came home at all on Saturday night, it was drunk. Usually if I had any money, I didn't even come home. I may not come home sometime till the next Saturday or the next. Why did that little wife say, I wasn't worried tonight? You know, as we grow, as we live, and I learned this from people like you, the wonderful power, the tremendous power of faith. And then some three years ago, I was privileged to be permitted to be associated with people with alcoholic problems on a daily basis.
And it came to me something that one of the most impressive talks, I believe, that I ever heard uh, in the first early days of my sobriety uh, was made by Burton Crawford. And I remembered this when he said that the only way that you can keep it is to give it away. And that just so long as you try to pass it on, it will grow within you. Thank God for those words. Thank God that I, who is nothing of myself, am permitted to be associated with people like you. And I mean that literally. Because I have a lot of people like you that I'm associated with daily. Uh, they're in a state hospital. But they're people like you and I. There are people whose life has become unmanageable. There are people who are powerless over the use of alcohol. And there are people who God has given me the privilege of trying to pass on just a little bit of what you have given to me. And I guess that's the reason that I'm so grateful and that I was so grateful when Emory asked me to come down here not for myself, not for the glorification of Henry, but because I want everybody to know in this town, in this state, in this country, or in this whole world, that there's a way. But more than anything else, I want that sick man or that sick woman to look upon us as a, a living testimony that there's hope for all of us. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and I hope that you may spend your days in somewhat the manner that I think of the comfort, the comforting thought that I have each day as I ask my higher powers, I understand him for a better day. And be comforted by the thought that you and I never have to drink again if we don't want to. Thank you, Lot. Thank you, Henry, for sharing with us your experience, strength, hope, and faith. It came right from your heart, your big heart. I share a little experience with Henry on that mix-up on the name business. His mix-up wasn't his fault, but my mix-up was my fault. When I came in, I told him my name was Sam. I guess I either didn't know what it was or ashamed of it, one of the two. But I have finally found to my great pleasure that I'm very appropriate name now. SA stands for sober alcoholic. <laughs> I resented it all my life, but I'm really proud of it now. Now this lady we have with us from down in East Texas I met several years ago and I didn't talk to her for just a few minutes ago. I was very sure that she was in the program not on the program. And I like that expression because being on the program, we're likely to slip and fall off, which none of us really want to do. So if we can get in the program, we're much safer. We're in it. We're in the arms of a power greater than ourselves. And it's uh, with great pleasure that I give you people today Marge Steve. Kill her. Thank you, S.A. It's good to be here and to be a part of this 
Northeast Texas Area Conference and to be in Dallas sober and to look out and see so many, many faces, hello Dorothy, that I haven't seen in so long because I don't get to travel as much as I used to. But I'm grateful to be a part of this wonderful movement today and to be able to tell you that I am Marge and I am an alcoholic. And by the grace of God in this wonderful program, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink in seven years and nine months and six days today. And that is by the help of a very merciful God and strictly a one-day-at-a-time program and sometimes less than one day. I get it whittled down sometimes to 30 minutes at a time. I found out this summer that uh, length of sobriety is nothing. <laughs> we work this thing one day at a time, and that's no joke. I believe that Henry just just about told my early childhood, except uh, I hated my stepmama. I never did have to live with her, praise God, but I sure was thrown around her some. And I became, um, this is part of my story, uh, strangely enough, Henry, you set off a, a train of thought I have never told in my AA story before, and I feel sure it has a great deal to do with why, if that's important, that I became an alcoholic. But you hit upon some uh, thoughts that I want to share. Uh, one of them was that uh, my mother divorced my father when I wasn't but three, and it was poverty, poverty. I had two older brothers, and we lived in Fort Worth, but I vividly remember the bread line. And I remember my mother having two Indian blankets, which was a proud possession of hers, and she sold them for a dollar apiece to buy money to buy meal and a little oleo in those days, which was uncolored, if you'll remember, and uh, a loaf of bread. And she made mush. How many has ever eaten that god-awful dish called mush? And I will not eat it till this good day. I'll eat its kin called prima wheat, but not mush. Uh, those are days that uh, I don't even like to think about. Maybe that's why I've shut them out of my AA story completely till now. And then I remember my mother moving to East Texas, close to where my brothers were. And the reason they were there is because my father was there and he was in the photographer business. He was quite good at it. And so he hired my brothers. Times were still rough, real rough. But mother began to feel insecure and she felt as if she shouldn't be in a city like Fort Worth alone with a small little girl to raise. So she moved to East Texas with me. And wouldn't you know that uh, I had to go to school the same junior high school and the same high school with two stepsisters that were never legally adopted but carried my same name, maiden name. And they drove my father's car to school and they ate in the cafeteria and they wore pretty clothes. And I walked to school sometimes with cardboard in the soles of my shoes carrying my little sack lunch of whatever we might have and my dresses were hand-me-down from aunts and cousins made over. And I went through my junior high and part of my high school years under those circumstances. And I look back now, no wonder I'm so blame mean. I had to be. <laughs> the one girl was a year younger than myself and one was a year older. One was named Bobby and one was named Nadine. And in spite of the Dickens, one of them would get in trouble and I'd be called into Ms. Rucker's office. What did you do so and so far? Well, I'm not Nadine, I'm Marge. <laughs> and she'd get us all mixed up. And But I was the one she'd always call. And finally one day I told that woman, the Dina girl, I said, Miss Rucker, I wish you wouldn't call me in here anymore. I said, it's embarrassing enough to have to go to school with those two girls. Their name's not Learstang, their name's is Pace. They're not my daddy's daughters. I'm the only daughter he has. And I'm a good girl. And I wish you'd quit calling me in here for the things they do in school. Because I intend to tell my mother and father about this now, which I didn't do. My poor mother had enough worries just keeping food in the mouth without going home and telling her what Miss Rucker had done to me. But anyhow, enough of that part of my story that I never have told, which uh, is a good background story. I was raised in extreme poverty. I quit school and went to work at an early age. 
I married at an early age to get away from home. I married a, I think the third boy I ever dated because he was the gay boy about town with a new automobile and good-looking clothes and wild way about him, and I liked that. I had never experienced any of it. I was very sheltered. He was good-looking and dashing. So he says to me, let's get married. I says, let's do. So two months later, Uncle Sam got him and kept him for three long years overseas. The sum of that story is that I had a little boy, early age, had to go to work at an early age. My mother became ill and was unable to do any work herself, even the babysitting work she'd been doing, and I had her to support, my little boy to support, and myself during the war. So I moved to Fort Worth, which is where I went to grade school and part of junior high, and I was familiar with Fort Worth, and there's where the war plant was, and I had taken a little side training at the college there in Kilgore and had studied as a draftsman and was hired by Consolidated as that, which was quite a good job for my age. But when I got to Fort Worth, the the old bad luck deal was following me again everywhere I went, and this is not the pity poor me thing. This is the God's honest truth of my childhood and my early life. Uh, They gave me an examination of my eyes, first off, which was routine, but lo and behold, I couldn't see but just half as good out of one eye as I could out of the other and can't this good day. But that kept me from hiring out for what I was trained for. So I had to go into the next best at my age, which was clerking. Well, this didn't pay as much as I thought it ought to pay. So here again in my story, I say I had to start learning to push and shove and excel by any means I could adopt to get ahead and to stay ahead of that old thing called poverty and the almighty dollar. I was always behind with enough money to do the things that was necessary to live and to keep the wolf away from the door. I managed those three years while my husband was overseas and even managed to save a little money, ironically enough. And when he came back, I met a complete stranger, and I'll get through this part of my story hurriedly. He was a full-blown alcoholic, and I had learned in the meantime what the old bottle of beer was, and I liked it, and I liked lots of it. And I found people that worked at Consolidated during the war that liked beer just like I did, and we all had our favorite joints that we hung out at, and I ran with an older group. They gave me comfort and security in a way that I needed because the world was big to me, awfully big. And I was still at a very young age having to make this living and in a big town like Fort Worth and crammed into a big war plant during the day If any of you ever worked there, do you remember that you didn't see daylight all day long? You punched in before dark, uh, I mean, before daylight in the morning. It was just dark as pitch. And you didn't get out until 3.30 in the afternoon, which was actually 2.30. You never knew whether it was raining or snowing or what outside. Three long years of that kind of a life. I I wonder that I'm not down one of your places, Henry, on the other side, that is. But at any rate, I weathered that storm, and it... uh, It was to the good, I think, because that was a portion of my life that helped to grow me up to withstand the knocks that was ahead. If I thought my childhood was rough, I just didn't know what was in store for me. But my husband came back, and we got a divorce after a year of trying to find a happy medium, and it wasn't there. And this little boy didn't know him, and I didn't know him, and neither could we find anything to base the marriage on. But my mother wanted to go back to East Texas again where the boys were, and so we went back to East Texas. There was a little span of time that I must throw in here because it was in Dallas. Uh, My husband's mother lived here, and he re-enlisted at Love Field out here, and I didn't want any more of this this Army bit, this Air Force bit. I had all that war and, uh, and business of overseas and so forth that I wanted. Now, I wanted to live a normal everyday eight to five life. But at any rate, he decided he wanted to re-enlist, and this was the portion of our life where we separated, and I had to go to work again. I went to work here at Neiman's, and if someone's in here that works at Neiman's, just forgive me, because this is the God's honest truth, too. I had already established my pattern of drinking at the war plant. I liked that beer, as I said, and I liked lots of it. And I didn't have a hard time finding folks at Neiman's that liked the same thing. 
the women that worked in the office with me, we had a little little place right down the back entrance of Neiman's, about a half a block down the street, that uh, was a beer joint and served those good cold glasses, you know, with frost on them. So I, every afternoon, as soon as we punch that old time clock, here we go down there. And I'd buy around, and she'd buy around, she'd buy around, and we had all these words of wisdom that we passed out. I often wonder what we really did talk about when we was buying all those rounds of beer. But at any rate, I worked at Neiman's about eight months, and I can't say that I did not enjoy uh, that I did not enjoy it. It was uh, another good experience for me because I learned how to live on less than I had ever learned to live on in my entire life. That's the poorest paying place I ever saw. <laughs> I got on down to uh, East Texas with my mother, and uh, there I found a, another new, complete environment. I had this knowledge of clerking. I had knowledge of detail from my drafting experience. I had knowledge of typing in school, and I had taken a night course at Fort Worth. All of my time during the war wasn't spent at uh, a beer joint. <laughs> But I did learn shorthand. I took these qualities that I had acquired and I hired out for a drilling company there. And wouldn't you know, I was the only woman in the whole organization and I was the baby of the organization. And uh, in case you're not acquainted with the practices of the drilling industry, well, there was an awful lot of passing out of whiskey until Uncle Sam clamped down. You know how he is now. You just don't do that anymore. But in those days, you passed out whiskey to obtain contracts, and uh, this was a usual procedure for any large company. So the two pushers were quite close friends of mine, and they were like my big brothers, and they acquainted me with something new, the hard stuff. Up until then, I was a beer drinker, because that was all my pocketbook could afford, but there I found out about the whiskey, and I liked it. It, it did something for me so much faster than that beer did, and you didn't have all of that wasted time, you know, involved. <laughs> and so I became a great lover of a good brand of whiskey. Now, I will say this, and I will emphasize it. Even though I was a hard-working girl, and my salary wasn't big, uh, it was a shame that they had to introduce me to a good brand of whiskey because it got to be a detriment later on down the line. I never did get to where I could drink cheap whiskey. I drank the wine, but I couldn't get that cheap whiskey down. But at any rate, I worked for this company about three years. And mind you, I'm divorced, uh, living at home with Mama and my son. And it was this period of time that I realized something was different about me than most people that I drank with. I formed my habit again of drinking right after I got off from work. A little joint was a half a block down from the drilling company, and here was, I look back now, all the old stock, you know, me included, all congregated there, and I buy this round, they buy the next round. These same words of wisdom came out. But, you know, there's something happened along in that period of time. It got to where I couldn't get to work on Monday, and then uh, I'd start my week of drinking a little earlier, and it lasted a little longer and a little longer, and that's in the days of the flu. That was before virus, so I began to... I didn't like having to lie for me. She did for a while, called in my office, and Margie's got the flu. Well, the flu became so frequent until Mother got ashamed. I'm not lying for you anymore. It's against my religion for you to drink anyhow, and by the way, she's a hard-shell Baptist. And Mama began to ding-dong and ding-dong, so I got to where I wouldn't come home. I'd find my places to drink without coming home. And my job held in jeopardy, and yet I was the breadwinner, and things began to get real serious. And I have said many times I had a good boss there. I'd have been fired long before. But he knew that I was my, the sole support of my mother and son, and I think he kept me on long, long time past the firing stage. But Mr. Bass told me one time I shall never forget. He said, Marge, you have a unique personality, but there's something deep inside you that's just gnawing away. He said, why don't you take this to your God in your church instead of to the places that you're taking it? And I shall never forget, because he told a great truth. There was something gnawing on the inside of me, and it was the fact that I was tired of working. I was tired of never having any money to do anything I wanted to do with, and I was tired of mouths being open, looking to just me to fill them up. 
Never in my entire life had I had anything called childhood. The early teens, like my daughter is experiencing now, it must be simply wonderful. And also, uh, your early 20s when life is pleasant and you're beginning to do things in your married life that are exciting and your children coming along. All of this I knew nothing of. It was just plain old hell trying to find enough to make ends meet. Here's where I met my present husband in this state of mind and this state of financial jeopardy and bless Joe. He says, I love you, I want to marry you, and I will give you the things that you need. And uh, I thought about this. And Joe knew just about half of what I drank, by the way. Uh, he says that you do, I think, drink too much, but you won't do that, Marge, if you have a home and if you're given the things in life that every woman should have security and someone that loves them, someone to take care of your child and your mother for you. Well, this sounded like manna from heaven. So I said, that's the thing for me to do, is to get married. Now, mind you, the reason I'm hesitating here in my story is because I was sort of a man-hater. I didn't like this business of marriage. I had had it up to here. I had done everything possible with this idol that I had married the first time, this Romeo, you know, that everybody has when they're young. There's one Romeo that you fall so desperately for. And that was the one that went overseas and left me for three years and came back somebody else that I didn't even know. So I was a man-hater, a marriage-hater, and I kind of liked being my own boss. But it all sounded so good, so I got married. And here's where the story really takes a turn. Because Joe didn't know it, but he gave me everything I didn't need. (laughs) I was better off a working girl. I was given a country club membership. I was given a bank account. I was given an automobile, my first, my very first automobile. My mother had never owned a car. We walked or rode the bus every place we went. And I was given a maid and a home and babysitter when I needed it. And I went actually hog wild. You've never seen anything to equal it. You know, you can... uh, uh, Boy, that country girl came to town now. Uh, Working at Neiman's up here didn't do a thing for me. Uh, You'd have thought that I had never been out of the backwoods. I established my charge accounts. I got out that country club and I found that bar with those pretty glasses and those mixed drinks. My goodness, that was just heaven itself. And sit up there at that bar and order those fancy drinks just to find out what they tasted like and what they were made out of. Going and utilizing those charge accounts, I must have really been something when I look back on it now. And I wouldn't drive a car except one year because I would be tagged if I, if I drove a car more than one year. I had to have a new one every year. I can remember eight straight years of having a new Pontiac every year. And every year I also remember that the rubber mats in the bottom were all discolored and muddled up with spilled drinks and beer. How many of you have ever gotten in your car the next morning and nearly knocked you down when you got in? My car stayed like that after I got a new one. I didn't take care of it. But I'll insert this here. I missed the jails, Henry. I don't know how. I should have been in there many times. Never was picked up, DWI. I never got a ticket for anything other than overparking. I think that's miraculous within itself. I never wrecked a car. I drove all of those automobiles up and down those East Texas highways and byways and never killed anybody. Drunk as a skunk. But I began to hit the hospitals. Now, mind you, Joe and I have had a little girl by now. She was premature. The little Kathy, the teenager I speak of, I know that the reason for that was because I drank continuously from the time I got pregnant up until I had her over two months early, three pounds and three ounces. But you wouldn't have gotten me to admit that then. I had a doctor that didn't understand alcoholics and delivered Kathy, and he never said anything about that there might be a possibility that she was born early due to the fact that uh, I drank too much. No, because his wife was a pill head. And so if he said anything about my drinking, then he'd almost have to say something about his own wife being a pill head. I didn't know all that then. You know, we do get educated in this program the hard way. But my first hospitalization for alcoholism wasn't so bad. Oh, I had yellow jaunders. That wasn't bad. And I was uh, skinny as a pencil, and that wasn't bad. And this same doctor that I'm speaking of, he didn't say anything about my drinking. 
He just said, I was burning the candle at both ends too much to cut out some of this entertaining that Joe was doing and to also uh, eat better, sleep better, rest more, play more golf, play more golf. Well, gosh, but this time I'd gotten into that golf thing out there at that country club because that was the thing to do. You know, this country girl wanted to do everything that was the thing to do. And uh, being a typical alcoholic-minded someone, I wanted to be noticed and to make sure everyone there knew I was there, so I bought this elaborate golf bag, black and pink. You remember when black and pink came in? I think that was for the color, not for us, but uh, anyhow. <laughs> and in my golf shoes, I ordered special black and pink. And I ordered me some shorts from Neiman, black and pink. And that's the way I went out that East Texas Golf Course Country Club there in that black and pink outfit, and they knew I was there. There was no doubt. You could see me. But when my doctor advised golf, he didn't know that I, that was one of my favorite hobbies that had gotten me in the most trouble because I played tournament golf. And we drank when we came in because we won or we drank because we lost or we just drank because we wanted to drink. And I didn't have to be home at any certain time if I was out on the golf tour so I didn't have to report in at any certain time at home. And I could kind of sober up before I came in to face Joe. So golf was one of my favorite hobbies. So when my doctor told me to take up a little more golf, that's just what I did. And so it wasn't too awful long until I got to where I wasn't accepted by my golf buddies, even though they were heavy drinkers. I wasn't accepted by that highfalutin bunch out that country club because I had to have two drinks to their one. And I couldn't hide that very well out there. And they began to sort of snub me. Well, I, I thought this, you know, how we rationalize things. Well, I got along a long time before I saw y'all anyhow. So I took my drinking away from the country club. And I went back out to where I was comfortable, and that was in the honky-tonks. I am one of those East Texas honky-tonkers, and I'm not ashamed of it. Some of the finest people I ever met in my life I met in a honky-tonk. And I can't say very much for the country club set, because when I got in the hospital that last time for drinking, the only poses and cards I got was from my honky-tonk friends. Those country clubbers didn't want to be connected with that drunk up there sobering up in the hospital. Didn't want their name linked with her. Well, there's some of them there in Kilgore that had to call me, you know. It's in that country club set. And they drank a little too much, too. But anyhow, back to my story of my humiliation there in Kilgore and the things I did to Joe and to my children. Uh, Joe was a businessman. He, at that time, worked some 40 or 50 men in a small community. And here his wife was ripping and snorting up and down the road. And all these honky-tonks. And, of course, I always had a car that no one else had one like, the color or something, you know. And so there he'd be parked in one of these joints. And I migrated. You know, we have a way of wanting to be a little better than anyone we're around, especially this country girl. If she got a taste of this money and this whiskey, you know. So we migrate from a higher class honky tonk on down to a little lower class honky tonk, and on down to where we always feel a little superior to who we're around. But I finally migrated on down there at that lowest one we got in East Texas, and it was called Dudes. And it was out on Stone Road, left out of Kilgore, going toward the airport about a half a mile. It was a little old bitty frame building that housed three tables on the inside and a little bar not as long as this table with about five stools up at it. And the biggest, fattest woman bartender you ever hoped to see. And the finest old soul that ever lived. If it hadn't have been for her, I'd either be dead or killed on the highway or some horrible something happened to me because she has saved me from myself many times. But there was my last home for the last two years of my drinking, which was that beautiful pathological drinking. Uh, wait until time for dude to open up. Wait for the liquor stores to open. Run out there and be the first in the place. She hasn't even swept out from the night before, but you got to have somebody to talk to you. you got to have a a glass of water, and, and her have a drink with you right then. Uh, get this thing going, because you're dying on the inside. I had been introduced to AA. I had read this stuff, but I did not want to apply it to myself. 
I had a very close friend who later became my sponsor, who was an active member of AA there in Kilgore, that told me, Marge, you and Joe, uh, you knew how I drank and the trouble I got in. Why don't you come and go with me to AA and uh, stop this squirrel cage business? I said, Doug, don't talk to me about that now. I said, uh, this was my second hospitalization for drinking, by the way. And he had come and taken of his time from business to introduce me to this program again. Brought me all this literature. And I said, Doug, don't you bug me about this now. I said, I'm not ready for this AA thing. I said, now, it's good for you. I've seen it work for you, and uh, I'm not knocking it. But now, I haven't gone that far. And I just think that it's not the time for me to even talk to you about it, but I'm glad you came. And I saved the literature, and I put it in that nightstand drawer, you know, how they have them in the hospital be bed, and I put it underneath everything so the nurses wouldn't see that it had AA on it. Not that I wasn't checked in that place for being drunk, extremely drunk, and very ill, mind you, and they all knew it, but I didn't want the nurses to see that AA literature. So the next day... Now, the fog began to lift a little, you know, and I began to think about what Doug had said, and I began to think about that literature that he left, but I certainly didn't get it out during the daylight hours and read it. I waited until the hospital settled down that night. All the lights went out, and then I get it out, and I read it. And it made sense, but I still didn't apply it at that time. And Doug came back again, and I said, I'll tell you something, Doug. I read that literature, and that's good. But I can't sober up now because this was in November, the first part of November. I said, Thanksgiving's ahead of us and Christmas is ahead of us and New Year's is ahead of us and you know I can't quit drinking now. I said, I've got all this entertaining to do. I said, you know how Joe is during the holidays. I said, so I'll talk to you about this after the first of the year. Well, they have jokingly labeled me in East Texas, the old gal in AA that pinpointed when she's going to sober up and join AA. And I guess that's about the way it was. Only I didn't plan my next three months myself. But I got out of that hospital, and I went home, and it was Thanksgiving, and I knew all the kin folks, you know how they are, talking about you. And they'd all said all the ugly things they could think of to say about poor old Joe and that woman he's married to. So I decided I'd prove to them that I wasn't that, that woman and that it wasn't poor old Joe and there wasn't anything wrong with me. Now, I am a size 20, and I am the color of a pumpkin, my eyes is bugged out, and they're yellow. But there's nothing wrong with me. But I throw this big Thanksgiving meal, and I invite all of Joe's kinfolks, and I invite all of my kinfolks, and it wasn't anything except just to show them. And, oh, I planned an elaborate meal, and I cooked, and I worked, and I got out all the crystal and the silver, you know, and had this elaborate buffet meal. And I made one error. I got out the punch bowl, and I fixed some eggnog, but it was for my mama. And I put that good brand of whiskey in it, but I wasn't going to touch a drop, not a drop. I intended that, and I think I truly meant it. But I fixed this eggnog for my mother. It was the only time that she would ever take a drink. And, you know, they came. Naturally, they would. Free meal and curious, too. And they came from far and wide, my folks and his folks, and they all looked at poor old Marge, you know. And they ate, and they wiped their bill, and they left. And I was by myself, and I was so tired. And I sat in, and I looked into that dining room, and there's about that much eggnog left in the bottom of that punch bowl. And I said, you know, one cup of eggnog never hurt anybody. And that started my last drunk, which lasted until January the 13th, the following year. And I say January the 13th, even though my sobriety date is January the 16th, due to the fact that it took me three days to get into the hospital, Three days for the thing to beat me finally into the ground. I had drank during this period of time in the bed, ordering my whiskey or conning Joe out of it, stealing it out of his bar, any way I could get it, sending the maid after it. I drank that period of time solid at home. I don't remember Christmas nor New Year's. I was convinced of the fact that I was going to die from drinking, so I was doing a good job of it. I knew I had cirrhosis to a degree, but I didn't know what at that time. I soon found out later to what degree. I was a pitiful specimen of humanity. I'm sure I was a poor specimen of a wife and a mother. No doubt about that. My children were even afraid to come into the bedroom where I was. I was so horrible looking and I was so mean to them. That was a period of time, you know, when a feather fell, it felt like they dropped the atomic bomb. But anyhow, it was during this period of time that... 
uh, that all is not so terribly, terribly bad. I don't know whether it's in the three-month period of my last drunk or, or prior to that. I'm sure it must have been prior, but there's a few little things in my talk everybody wants me to, to bring out. And when I don't bring it out, they, they fuss at me about it later, so I'll try to hit two of them right fast. One of them was this prosperity period that I hit when I'm bedded up in that bedroom of mine, feeling like I am the queen of Sheba. It's that period when the glow's on, you know. You've, you've been drinking for days on end, and there's a glow there where reality has long since gone, but you feel like you're a goddess or and you're, you're so wealthy. Always you're so wealthy for some reason. You've got more money than you know what to do with. And so whatever your little heart's desire should be, that's what you should have. This period of time, it has happened that that little Jew friend of ours that has the corner store there for ladies ready to wear and kill were called and says, I have six of the most gorgeous samples of mink stoves you have ever seen. And I'd love for you to see one, Marge. Says that after all, the position that Joe's in in the community and the position that you're in in the community, and I wondered later what he meant, you should have a mink stove. I said, well, I'm sorry, but um, never giving it a thought. And besides, I'm home ill with the flu, and I couldn't possibly come down and see them. Oh, that's all right, honey. That's all right. Let me bring them out to show you, which he did. And I lay right up there. I'd been on a toot for days and bought a mink stove laying flat on my back in the bed. Well, you know, you got to sober up sometime. And when I did, and there was that mink stove, and I knew Joe was coming home. And I saw the price on that thing. And I knew I had to tell him. And I was already, mind you, days in the doghouse. Well, you know how I felt. Well, I never have really liked that stove. In fact, I didn't even bring it on this trip. It's hanging in the closet at home. And it's hung there many a time when I could have worn it for this reason. Joe went down and drew up a note at the bank. And he co-signed that thing for me to pay that thing so much a month out of my drinking money. And I never have particularly cared for that stole till this good day. Now, that worked a terrible hardship on me. Then the other thing that I did during this, this last two years of my drinking, somewhere in there, I had a drinking buddy up the street. How many of you ever had a good old drinking buddy? You could depend on them any time during the 24-hour period to have a drink with you. One of those cronies that you could tell anything to and that drank just like you did and understood you like a, a, they were your kin. That was my drinking buddy up the street. Her and I drank in our gowns and our robes, you know? So this particular morning, I called her. I said, I'm coming up. You got a drink? No, I'm out. I got one. Be there in a minute. In my robe, get in the car and drive up the street and get out and got the bottle under my robe, you know, and go in. And there's a communication between drunks that you just don't have to say a word. Just go in and the glasses are waiting and the water chasers are waiting and just take the lid off and pour and drink, and the communication is there. Why say anything? That was this particular beautiful spring day as I remember it. And then we sit down to the honest-to-God kind of drinking, you know, around the old kitchen porcelain table, and uh, I look out the window at the neighbor, and here is this colored man out there, that old gray mule, and he's plowing up the neighbor a garden over there. And I said, look out there, doesn't that look good? Yeah, that looks fine. Have another drink? You know, I've always wanted a garden. Yeah, me too. I said, you know, I wonder if that man would plow me up a garden. Yeah, I bet he would. Have another drink, you know. So here I go out there in my robe, my gown tail, talk to that colored man, ask him if he'd plow me up a garden. Yeah. Where do you live? Down the street about four blocks. All right, when I get through here, I'll knock on the door and you show me where you live. So he knocked on the door and I showed him where I live. But this time I had that beautiful glow on, you know, that kind where I'm going to plant a garden and I'm going to raise things and I'm going to put food in the deep freeze and I'm going to save Joe money on the food bill and, oh, it's a smart wife I'm going to be and how proud of me he'll be. Get down there that colored man and I said, how much you charge me for plowing up half that backyard back there? Two dollars. I said, get after it. Getting close to lunch now and I got to cut this stuff off and, and have some semblance of sobriety when Joe comes in at the noon meal. And I began to worry about that backyard because I looked out there and Joe's worked three long years on that St. Augustine and here it is. All turned over and there's nothing but dirt sticking up out there and a little grass every now and then. And it looked kind of bad. 
So when Joe came home at lunch, needless to say, here I am with a pretty good glow on that I'm trying to shut down, and the half that yard plowed up. Well, I can't repeat right here what he said, but it was plenty. <laughs> now, I want to bring out that last hospitalization that when I finally went into the hospital on January the 16th, as I said, there was three days there that I could not hold anything on my stomach, not even water, and I tried to take a drink every way that man knows to drink stuff. And it wouldn't stay down, and that was God's intentions with me because I had already gone to the depths of my whole being. There was nothing left of me. I couldn't think. I was unable to get up. Bedridden is the word. I had to be helped to the bathroom. I was even more bloated than before. I knew I was terribly ill. In fact, I thought I was dying. That last time I went into the hospital, I called my own ambulance, and I told my colored maid, and by the way, she's with me here with my two children at the fair right now. She's been with me some 18 years, and that's a long time to keep colored help. But she ought to be up here telling my story. She could tell it better than I can. But old Jill, bless her heart, she fixed the stuff every way known to fix it. And says, Miss Margie, she says, you're not going to hold one down. I said, that's right, Jill, and let's call an ambulance. So they came, and they literally carted me out of their feet first into that hospital. And there was where I found my spiritual awakening that I'm certainly not ashamed to talk about. There's where my entire life took on a new something. There's where I found my God. There's where I got my answer about my drinking problem because I was so ill that I began to pray that simple prayer, Please, God, if you see fit to let me live, let me live without the bottle. And if I should die, please give my children a good stepmother. You see, the thing that I hadn't realized even in this nearly eight years of sobriety is that I hated that woman until Henry talked today. That stepmother business is in my mind because that was in my prayer in that hospital. And I don't know why, I just connected these two things. But at any rate, God heard me, and he knew that I was sincere, and he knew I was ill, and he knew I was one of those sick alcoholics that had gone as far as she could go. And I believe he knows the difference in these prayers. The kind, please, God, help me get out of this, and I'll never do it again, you know, over and over. And the one that I prayed up there, because he answered it. And from that time on, I can't think of anything other than getting mad at Joe a few times, but what hasn't been good in my AA life. I was an AA traveler. I latched on, and I got happy, and I rode the pink cloud, and at times I still get on it, and I act just exactly like I'm 30 days old in AA. I can get just as wound up about a new baby or a thing like this conference as if I'm brand new in AA, and I love it. Uh, to me, there's no happiness like the happiness of somebody that's been drunk all their life that finally finds the daylight. Now, that's true happiness. And I will quickly tell you the good things that's happened. I found out that being uh, a little bit with money was bad for me because Joe and I have been poor, poor, poor ever since I sobered up and have just done beautifully. And even that Yankee likes pinto beans and sow belly now. I didn't think I'd ever get him to eat it, but he is. And we have learned to love home. You know, not planning a trip for the weekend and not planning a, a golf tournament to go on and not planning a bunch of drunks to come in and belly up to that bar in there. That was our life. Uh, Joe just happened to be a heavy social drinker. He happened not to be the alcoholic. I happened to be the one. But we had many a drunk weekend. You know the sign, if we get to drinking on Sunday and it goes into Monday and we ask you to stay on, we don't really mean it, go home. <laughs> that was the kind of weekends we had. And I said, now our home is a home. It's a Christian home. Joe and I, neither one went to church before. I was ashamed to go to church. I can remember my first time going back to church after I sobered up. I was so scared. I wondered if the ladies wore gloves and if they wore hats. And I called to find out. It's been so long since I've been to church house. And I got there and I remember my hands trembling in my lap the first Sunday school lesson I tried to sit through. And I wondered if they were talking about me. Well, a month ago, I was elected president of the women's Sunday school class there in my group in the big Presbyterian church in Kilgore, one of the nicest. I'm proud of that. I'm the alcoholic gal that I didn't think they'd even speak to me when I went back. I worked three years in the junior Sunday school department, 
with young people. They brighten my life. I, I love young people. Hope I can always work with them. My poor old hard shell baby's mama's still living and she's forgiven me. She thinks I'm about the finest thing that was ever hatched now, even though she still calls it alcoholic. <laughs> and I live to see my husband not ashamed anymore. And I live to see him finally, after I went back to church for three years, finally the fourth year he went back with me. And the sixth year he began to teach in the younger people's department. Seventh year he continued. This year he's teaching the men's department. We're both very active. I'm bringing this out. I don't know why more alcoholics don't get up here and tell about their church life. My God, I think it's wonderful. That's the other part of this AA thing that they taught us about. AA has a very vital place in my life, but so does God in his home over here in church. I don't confuse them. I go straight from the church house if necessary, right down there at that wine old place in Kilgore and talk to some old wine if necessary. I don't care who sees my car out there. I'm happy. This has been a grand life. And it just gets better and better. And if it gets much better, I don't know that I can stand it. Thank you, Ethan. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.